Welcome to the Women's Wellness Podcast, where we interview experts in various fields with the goal of empowering women to make informed decisions about their health, life, and family. I'm your host, Amy Jane Smith, and I would like to thank you for tuning in today to get comfy while I introduce our next guest. Hello and welcome to the Women's Wellness Podcast. My name is Amy and I'm your host and today we are talking about breast cancer and my guest today is going to talk a little bit about her story with breast cancer and she's also going to talk about the relationship between sleep and cancer. So this is a two-parter. So today in this episode we'll be talking mainly about her cancer story and then in the next episode, we will focus more deeply on sleep and cancer. So this lady, she is an ICF approved certified life coach. She's a best-selling author and a heal your life teacher. She was first exposed to the mind-body connection during her career as an ear, nose and throat surgeon, where her curiosity was piqued by how the mind works and the effect it has on the body. She now works predominantly with people affected by cancer and helps them get back a good night's sleep, something that she knows gets terribly affected having survived cancer herself. So as I mentioned, she is a sleep and cancer coach, ear, nose and throat surgeon and an author. I would like to welcome Dr. Anita Ranganathan. Welcome. Welcome. Thank you for joining me. Let's get started. How how are you? I'm good. I'm good, good. It's it's a lovely day here. And um, yeah, everything is going great. I had my morning walk. So I'm all get up for the next, I guess, hour where we're going to be talking to each other. Yeah, it's good getting out for a walk. I, I went for a walk, actually, just before we started. <laughs> getting in the right zone and all yes. of that. Because, Absolutely. yes, sitting at desks isn't very good for you. Yeah. It's um, become a negotiable for me I I have to start off my day but I'm more of a very much of a morning person these days so yeah. I'm out there before kind of the crowd comes in and it's a good two hours of you know of, it's, it's really my me time it kind of really sets the tone for the rest of the day for me yeah oh wow yeah. two hours yeah wow. <laughs> yeah no I'm only half an hour but that's that's fine so well <laughs> I'm also walking an eight kilometer in mid-February. It's less than a month from here. I'm supporting, uh, you know, I'm supporting one of the uh, foundations. So I don't want to end up, you know, getting totally freaked out by it. So I'm kind of building up towards it. So I'm almost there. I did seven kilometers today. So I think I'll be good by the time it, um, the actual date for the um, eight kilometer. Oh, yeah. No, that will be perfect. No, training, training is good. Training is good. So today, um, I mentioned in my intro that you have gone through breast cancer Mm -hmm. and you've kind of come out the other side with a bit of a shift in focus in your career. So you started off as an ear, nose and throat surgeon and you've moved now towards more life coaching. But I wanted to touch on your story first and foremost and how how that affected your life and your trajectory in a way. So, I mean, really in your own words, describe your breast cancer story for me. (laughs) Um, I would actually put it as, you know, part one, part two and part three. So part one is from the time when um, I could actually feel the lump and when I really had to listen to myself and think of all my years of experience as a doctor and a surgeon where I've diagnosed so many people with cancer. Right. And yeah. really addressing and really building up the courage and saying, okay, this is something that I better go and get it checked out because you just know that there's just something wrong. So that's start- the first thing, isn't it? Yeah, that's, that's when it really hits you. It starts hitting you back then itself. And uh, the beauty of this is that the memories are so fresh um, no doubt it's it's been like about a year now, but um, you can still, I mean, I can literally remember the the uh, milestones around the journey. And so really with that, and then, uh, you know, you go to your GP and then 
the GP tries to be really nice and says, oh, well, you know, it could just, it doesn't have to be anything to be worried about, but let's just get it checked out. And I said, sure. <laughs> and she's like, yeah, we'll try to get an appointment as soon as possible. And yeah, I pretty much got diagnosed within um, a week. And this was around the time when we were barely beginning to know about the impact of the pandemic. Um, right. It was kind of like, so yeah, yeah, it was, it was just back, back then in February. And um, yeah, I got my diagnosis like really soon within about a week. Um, I mean, they wanted to call me in within the next two days itself. And okay. I said, can I get a little bit more of time? Because this is really taking, it's really taking a lot out of me, you know? So the mammogram and the ultrasound, and then they did the BAPS immediately and all those things. Okay. So one part of it, the part of when you get confirmed. And then starts the whole journey where you just kind of go into complete like to-do mode, uh, where it is like, you know, oh, I need to call on my insurance. I got to make sure that everything gets covered on time. What do I do about the kids? Who's going to take care of them? Um, how, where are we going to get those extra finances just in case, you know, something comes up? Um, who do I tell and who do I not tell? Yes. <laughs> Whose support do I get? Who support? I think I will end up supporting them instead. Um, you know, so it's like, and then, and then suddenly, you know, it's so interesting, Amy, because your emails previously would have been something you subscribed to. And suddenly yeah. you know, it's become all these doctor's appointments and all this juggling of going around here, there, you know? Um, right. Yes. It's um, so, yeah, you, you know, you do all of that get operated um, again in the midst of COVID. Um, and um, after that, it was, um, I had to undergo a surgery twice. Um, okay. And I had to undergo radiation. So the radiation was like level four of when New Zealand had a shutdown. Oh, really? <laughs> but it was good for me in a way because, um, and I think, I think at that point in my life, I didn't want to be sitting in waiting rooms discussing, hey, what's your stage? Hey, how's your prognosis? Um, and, you know, things like that. Like, I just really, really, for the first time in my life, I think I really decided to completely focus on myself. Yeah. I think, again, as women, we really, really, really do. Everybody else is more important. But yeah, um, yeah that's very true. <laughs> being a woman and being a physician and a surgeon, it doesn't help. Everybody else is more important than you are. Yeah. And um, so, yeah, I underwent my whole radi radiotherapy. Um, it was interesting because I was working full time um, and I thought, um, you know, I'll be able to cope. Hey, you know, everything is fine and it's early stage and all of that. So I chose to go back into work. Uh, pretty much three days after finishing. So I just had the weekend off and I went back into work after that. In spite wow. of everyone saying, yeah, in spite of everyone saying that, oh, well, you know, radiation, you get fatigue and all of that. I'm like, ah, nah, I'll be fine. I'll be fine. Um, and true enough, a month later, I was, I think I was struggling and more than anything else, my team was struggling with me as well. Um, you know what I mean? Um, because you may be physically there doing a full-time job, but you just can't cope. You just can't cope. No. Um, You've got everything else going through your heads and everything that you're managing. Absolutely. And the fatigue is the fatigue is real. The fatigue is real. By five o'clock, six in the six o'clock in the evening, there's really nothing that you can do. You know, no matter how good you've been. And um, that's just the way it is. That's the it's, it's really for me, I think it's the body trying to tell you you need to really slow down and focus on yourself right now and don't push yourself. Don't try to be Wonder Woman. <laughs> yes that's so. it doesn't matter what happens in our lives we always try to make sure everybody else is okay and the one of the blessings I suppose of COVID is that you there wasn't anybody around yeah you, you could sit in a waiting room and be two meters away from somebody else and they didn't want to talk to you nobody wants to talk to anybody no, no. and it's quite a nice little safe space to Absolutely. To not have to deal with anybody else's energy. Yes, absolutely. And I think for me, it was, I was always very conscious of how much extra knowledge I wanted to have. So even if I was Googling up something, uh, and I'm really grateful for having that medical background because I knew what to Google, what to rely on, what not to rely on. Um, yes. And that really went very much in my favor as well. Um, I, I feel very, very blessed. 
And uh, then, you know, you finish your treatment. And um, what's interesting is like the support just falls off, you know, um, you're at this cliff and you're like, okay, I've kind of done my treatment and I finished my treatment. And I, I did like everything that I possibly could think of, you know, so I went completely plant-based. I, I went into organic food. I was still doing my 20 minutes walks around the block because at that time we could only do, luckily at that time we were allowed to do exercise around the blocks. So I used to make sure I used to at least do that. I went heavily into juicing and tried to reduce as much of stress. I was, I've always been a person who's done meditation and journaling, but this time around it was even more. So it was a really holistic thing that I look, you know, to get it as I, I was, it's basically, it's like, you want to really give it your best shot. You know, this is one time in your life where you just realize like, you don't want to take it easy. You know, you have to really, really, you know, do the best you can. And I'm not even going to the part of the complications I had after surgery and the physiotherapy I had to go for and all those things. So let's let's not go into that part of it. That's just part and parcel of it. And so you finish your treatment and then all that support and all the scaffold that's been around you mm. is it just kind of suddenly falls off, you know? And everyone says, oh, well, you know, you finished treatment, you're fine now and you're going to, you're back to normal. And right. never ever tell that to anybody who has undergone and finished a treatment for a life-threatening condition because you, you never go back. You, you can go back to normal, but it's a completely new normal. You know, it's where it comes in my, what would be my third stage of where you kind of consider yourself a survivor or a thriver, which again is a very gray area because yeah. who knows who is a survivor? Who knows who is a thriver? There's no clear cut definition. And it can change as well, can't it? So okay. you can feel like you've got this power. Yeah. And then you'll have days where you just want to hide away from the world and you don't know how you ever dealt with anything ever. Absolutely. And Absolutely. And so that is the part of the journey that I am on right now. Um, you know, you go for your daughter's appointments and everything, but that, that trepidation is always there. Is he going to find something? Is my oncologist going to find something? And with breast cancer, what happens is because you've got different types of breast cancer, some of which are okay. the commonest one is the one which is sensitive to your hormones. So yes. the commonest one is which is sensitive to your estrogen and progesterone, which basically means the cancer is literally feeding off these hormones, mm. which is there in every, which, yeah. everyone. Like even men have it up to a certain extent, but obviously it's more than females, you know? And so that's what makes it really very different because it's not like you have finished your surgery or your radiation or your chemotherapy, but right now they also continue on for quite a few of us hormonal therapy where oh, okay. they are trying to bring, they want to kind of really kill all the estrogen progesterone that you have in your body, which means that you are going to be hit with menopause yes, of course. before you need to. And it's, it's an abrupt cut. It's not something that you kind of, yeah, Easy. it's not gradual, it's menopause. Yeah, it's there, it's menopause. You know, so here you are like still getting over that fact of being diagnosed with cancer and everything that happens around it. And then it never really, like every time you need to take that tablet or that injection, it's that constant kind of a reminder saying you, it's, it's, it's still a little bit of a confusion whether you tell someone I had cancer or I have cancer. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> it's that kind of a constant reminder and I think this is actually the most beautiful and revealing part of the entire cancer journey because you really really get to know um, so much more about yourself and I think that's where for me my transition of moving from away from mainstream medicine to really I, I am very much of a people person and for me I need to continue contributing towards people so that was definitely, it wasn't going to go anytime, anywhere in the future. Um, but what I did really focus on was really establishing and putting myself first, which is something which we don't do. We don't do it as a wife. We don't do it as a parent. We don't do it as the type of work, the type of work that we do. You don't have to be a doctor. Most of us are so married to our jobs. It's not been funny. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. I understand that. <laughs> and, um, you know, so that's, it's all part of that. So that's where I realized, but, but I, through my having traversed the journey myself, um, there's been a lot of self-reflection that's gone. And I sit back and I cringe at some of the things that I may have told my patients when I may have either diagnosed them with cancer or operated on them in cancer mm -hmm. and being 
ear, nose, and throat surgeon till about four years ago, you know, you're dealing with important stuff. Like you, people can't talk, people can't eat, people can't breathe, and they come to us. And we never, ever thought about that. Whereas, honestly, breast cancer is not so harsh. You know, you're not losing out on anything, which is very pivotal, mm. uh, if you know what I mean. Yeah. And, um, you know, yet it just changes you so much. And I realized that the real transformation actually happens between doctor's appointments, between your oncologist appointments, um, oh. and what you are doing by yourself. You know, and I think that's what is really going to set up to a certain extent how this journey is going to go. And that kind of a support, although you do have a lot of support over here, but someone who's there literally to kind of sometimes hold your hand, sometimes hug you. I mean, you know what coaching is about, right? So I don't have to tell you about that, but that this is this is really coaching people who really, it's really about making them aware of that innate power that they actually already have within themselves. I'm not going to be sitting over here and saying, oh, you need to do juicing or, you know, you need to meditate every day because you're already dealing with a diagnosis yeah. of cancer. You don't want to learn a new tool at that time. All you want to do is just be kind of sane, <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> you know, and um, that's where the whole thing came in. And my main interest in sleep related was because I realized that Again, you know, as soon as you start feeling that lump or you start having that symptom and you start thinking about mm, what could it be mm. from that time, your sleep levels really, and... yeah, the whole thing just goes totally over. And they've done studies where they have monitored people up to 18 months after finishing treatment, after having completed treatment for cancer and their sleep is still like nowhere near how it used to be before. 18 months. Wow. After finishing treatment you know and that is the impact and if you haven't slept properly then you know getting up in the morning and going for that walk is going to be such a nightmare yeah. you know trying to even cook anything on your own is a nightmare yes and so so many people don't have that support and they have to or they're Absolutely. they're a primary carer for somebody else and now they've got to look after themselves and yeah, how do you do that if you're so exhausted? Exhausted, absolutely. You know, and even for you to even turn up for your chemotherapy appointments or, you know, your doctor's appointments, if you've had a good night of sleep, you somehow feel so much more prepared to face the world, even if it yeah. means your own people and setting boundaries and saying, no, at this time, it's me and I'm not going to turn up for that party. I'm not going to organize the kids' birthday parties. Um, because simply because I can't do it. But even for that, if you yourself are tired and fatigued, and there's so much of science behind it, you know, sleep is so big, but I really think it's the foundation of all the other pillars of health. It is. I mean, I know we've said when we were chatting beforehand that without sleep, nothing else really happens. Absolutely. Um, I wanted to touch on before, because we could delve into sleep I know <laughs> talk about it for hours and I want to make sure that that's we focus on that in our second part I wanted to um ask you more about your coaching so you you moved into coaching was that four years ago when you switched out of the surgery or is that kind of melded and molded and it's so interesting no it's so interesting um I so I did, I did become my, you know, the certified certification and everything four years ago. Okay. And then I moved to New Zealand and um, oh, okay. just to put it in a very nice way, let's just put it this way. I think really life really came in the way of me putting again, myself, um, forget about first anywhere important. Mm. So a lot of personal challenges that happened, um, a lot of illnesses. So besides me being a cancer survivor, I had, I became a caregiver of um, my own spouse who ended up having a brain tumor. Oh my goodness. In a few weeks of my moving over here, you know, he, he got diagnosed. And so, you know how a brain tumor is. Thank goodness mm -hmm. it wasn't cancer, but it was the brain. Yeah. So I automatically became the person running the household, taking the kids, driving them to school, taking him to doctor's appointments, cooking, shopping, everything. And this yeah. is an country you know it's a new country yes so it was it was entirely different and that happened and then you know a year later we thought everything was fine and then he ended up having a seizure oh, um, no. then again for under one year no driving no nothing you know no. Um, 
So that that's how two years just went by. And um, then I, and also because I couldn't work, you know, because I didn't have a work permit then. Right. So I got the thing to work. I did several jobs. I tried teaching at one of the acupuncture colleges. Then I worked in the University of Auckland. So I've done like three or four jobs, but what the, the last proper job I actually even had was in an insurance company where they wanted somebody with a medical background. You know, so all of this, my plan was when I'm going to move here, I'm going to re, I've got to requalify if I want to do my ENT. So, you know, I've been preparing for my exams, but you know what? Life, <laughs> life is so unpredictable. And I think I've really realized at the end of this all is like, it's already kind of almost up to an extent predestined, you know, like they yeah, are it has a way of steering you, doesn't it? Absolutely, right? Because initially you feel like they're just kind of pushing you a little bit. And then finally you get something as big as this, like staring in your face. Yeah. And, um, you know, so I said, and I did the life coaching basically because I was coached. There was a time in my life where I got, you know, I was coached. And that's how we get exposure to life coaching, right? When you're first yeah. at the other end. And I just found it brilliant. I'm like, oh my God, no one ever prepared us for things like that. No one has asked me these questions in my life. Mm. And that's where the whole, you know, the whole beauty of everything came in. And I know even as a doctor, when people, when the patients used to come, you know, treating them of the colds or the coughs or something was relatively very easy. But I always used to ask them a little bit more and find out what's happening, why are they having it, what's happening, what's happening at home, yeah. or what's at work and things like that and this is like talking back 20 years ago because it's been 20 years since I've graduated um, back then no one talked about the mind-body connection you know it was just yeah. there it was kind of still very hoo-hoo yeah. and then going you know forward now it's been proven it's research has proven how you know your stress and inflammation and all of those things it's all been proven now and uh, so for me the whole thing of this whole coaching and everything just kind of came in really blended very beautifully um, and as I said earlier, I knew that I wanted to continue working and helping people. As you can see, all my jobs also were either helping training medical students or um, dealing with people who have sent in insurance claims, you know, who have sent in claims, they've been diagnosed with cancer or whatever. So I've always, always, kind of, that, the person. Yeah, always that kind of a person. And for me, the fact that right now, um, my life balance is very important. And the reality is that I come first. So for me, the fact that I have the privilege of having these amazing conversations uh, after making sure that my cup of self-care is full so I can be there and turn up for others is absolutely brilliant. Um, yeah. And, and speaking of self-care, yeah. it's, it's not just about the cup. Like that's yours. You have to give from the dregs in the saucer. It's absolutely. The overflow. Absolutely. Keep hold of that cup. Yeah. And that's a non-negotiable. Yeah. Yeah. Which is again, ah, super, super difficult for us. <laughs> yeah. It really is. Yeah. It really is. Yeah. So do you mainly work with um, women with breast cancer or do you work with anyone? No, it's with anyone. It's with anyone who's had cancer, who's been diagnosed with cancer, who's undergoing treatment with cancer. I mean, sorry, for cancer, because it's, um, yeah, everybody needs that support. Everybody needs that little bit of that help. Um, it's also about preparing them and empowering them through different parts of the journey. Yeah. And not really just putting everything, say, in the doctor's hands or whatever. So I do not give medical advice. And that is something which I've got to very, very clearly state, because I am not there as a doctor or a surgeon. I am here just as a coach. But what I could help them is, and what I do help them with is simple things like, you're going to meet your surgeon. You know, what are the things that you think you could ask? Um, how do you go prepared? Um, how do you go prepared for your chemo? Because these are, these are general things, but yet at that time, you're just not prepared. You're just not prepared. You know, you'd rather have somebody, because I know if I had a coach in my cancer journey, like I sit back and think one or two things, which maybe even I would have been able to do better. And this is in spite of me kind of yeah. a little bit more of an advantage compared to others. And I feel if I had someone who just said, all right, so today your to-do list is this, 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 because you just don't want to think. You just yeah. want to really just take over and say, okay, this is what you're going to be eating or, you know, whatever, whatever, this is how it's going to be. And I think that's where a coach is really brilliant. 
Yeah. And somebody who's gone through it as well, like myself, I haven't been through that journey. I wouldn't know the first thing I can support and lend an ear, but otherwise yeah, I don't know. And having somebody who's gone through that journey and helping them with some questions that they might need to ask is so important because your head goes all blah, 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 and you might not be so lucky to have an oncologist or a doctor or somebody who thinks outside of the questions that you're asking yeah, yeah. and you've got to you've got to push for that haven't you sometimes yeah. this is just part of it the other part also of it is besides as i mentioned it's what you actually do between your doctor's appointments that's really yeah. going to be of benefit and in a way it's really nice you know you do something which you uh, it's kind of a self-gratification thing right you've done something you've got like say three goals for that day that you have to do or three tasks i can't say goals yeah. Yeah. And you kind of are able to do those three tasks. You just feel like, you know what, all is not lost. I'm still capable of doing it. Yeah. Um, yeah. And really that's what coaching is about, right? It's about really making the person aware of what they can do. And like the way, you know, it's mentioned, smart goals, right? Yeah. So the, the theory behind it is still the same. The, the, the principles are still the same. It's just that it's a little bit more, because at this time when you're having cancer, you don't want to be thinking about a holiday, for example, and saving up to that right but what is, what is definitely finances and how is that going to support you towards your cancer treatment or to the other treatments because things like yoga and things like acupuncture they all have been scientifically proven to help you cope better with your cancer journey as well yeah. and those things aren't funded you know uh -huh. and so it's um it's it's there's a lot there's a lot that's there and it's and that's what i like to do because it's more of an integrative thing as well so I definitely do not, if someone says, oh, well, I don't want to go for this treatment and I don't want to go for that treatment. Uh, again, it's not my prerogative to um, advise them. But having said that, I make a decision about whether I even want to work with them or not. So for me, it has to be a person who is a good fit and who is going to benefit from me. Um, and so I think establishing that, establishing that um, agreement is very, very important. So I don't have a standard agreement, you know. For me, it's like, let's get on the phone, let's talk to each other first. Let's see, because you don't want to spend up 90 minutes and quite a bit of money with me if you if you don't get that rapport or vice versa. Yeah. You know, if, if you're arguing and butting up against each other, exactly. you're exactly. not going to get the best out of your treatment exactly. or anything. You're yeah, absolutely. And, yeah. You know, you can, if you, if, if the person is like, really, it looks like the person really needs like, say, could help or could, could benefit with therapy or seeing a counselor, then because coaching again is not therapy, but at a time like this, you definitely could do with some professional help. So if I feel yeah. that that person could actually, I won't say needs anybody, but if they feel like a coach may not be able, because coaching is not the same as therapy. No. It's a fine line, but it, it's, it's necessary, you know? So if somebody really needs that professional help, if they need the support in terms of medications to help them at that part of the journey, then again, I could help and support them towards that, but that's how it is. So it's really, it's such an individual journey. It's so unique and therefore it has to be personalized. Yeah. And having that referral network of those allied health providers that you can go, oh, this person's really good. Just yes. have a chat with them. Yeah. It's really beneficial. I have Absolutely. one last question I wanted to ask before mm -hmm. we move on to talking about the big topic of sleep. Sure. Um, it is a big question. Um, because this podcast is directed towards women, I want to go back to um, female identity, mm -hmm. which is huge. But a lot of women, if they're going through surgery or having any mastectomies, how, how do you approach that? And how did you deal with that? Did you have mastectomies yourself? or No, so I had to undergo a lumpectomy. Okay. Um, but I had it twice. Um, so I didn't require a reconstruction or anything, but I did require radiation after that. Um, having said that, the scars are still there. Yeah. You know, the scars are still there. And um, they're, they're, this again is a really interesting topic because there is so much of a variation in how people look at it. Mm. Uh, like many ladies are like, my um, gender identity doesn't have to mean that I have to have my breasts to be considered a female. 
Yes. And I would rather live with that thing of saying, you know, I got rid of the cancer in as or reduce my chance because my, quite a few people for what's called prophylactic mastectomy, which has become quite uh, famous because of certain, um, you know, actresses and people who are who yeah. have been for something like that. Um, and again, it's about really saying, do I want to live with that constant fear mm. of having maybe one small little cancer cell versus saying, okay, this doesn't make me in any way less of a woman compared to not having it. Yeah. Um, and it's also, you have to, even if you do try to go in for a reconstruction or you go for implants or whatever, what I really want to em emphasize on is that you need to be really, really well informed. You need yes. to know the pros, you need to know the cons and more than anything else. And most importantly, it has to be your decision because it's your body. It does. I mean, I know right now, if somebody said, yep, yeah, there's a lump, you have cancer, I would just be like, take them. Yeah, go. Just, absolutely. But if I'm in that situation or after that situation and they have removed them, then it's, oh, wow, what's what's happened? Yeah. There's there's a yes. OK, just, just, just get it off like, the, like there's a spider on me or yeah. and then realizing, hang on, what have I actually done? Yeah. Is there is there a mourning period for that, even if it is uh, bigger than just your breasts there is a morning in fact it's a beautiful question that you asked because believe it or not there has to be a morning period yeah if you don't have a morning period then you're going to end up having a lot of other other issues um ptsd is so common mm. is especially for highly driven women um, who just don't know how to sit and not do anything. Let's put it that way. Yeah. Who's, who's, whose identity is along their work and being the perfect mom, you know, all, all those things that we put ourselves up on. Yeah. And even though this is your body really kind of giving you the huge warning and saying, maybe it's time that you really need to have a relook at your life. Mm. Um, if you don't really go through that period of mourning, it's going to hit you. And it's going to hit you so hard. Um, it takes so much more. Yes. So whoever you want to moan, it's up to you. But you need at that time, I think it's quite beautiful when the body goes through the whole fatigue that we were talking about earlier. Yeah, It's really the way of them telling to say, of the body really trying to tell you, you know, you really need to slow down. Like we are forcibly, forcibly making you slow down. But God forbid that, God forbid that we have to learn our lesson in such a hard way. Yeah. Um, because no matter what it is, you know, the reality, Amy, is that what is the commonest thing that keeps everyone awake is, is it going to come back? Did I do enough? Yeah. You know, and then kind of looking beyond that and saying, okay, even if it, it's, it's really about facing your fears and all that. So it's an ongoing thing. Mm -hmm. But I think you have to get familiar with being in that place of sadness, of um loss of faith, yeah. uh, the lack of trust, because all those emotions come and you kind of feel like, ah, oh, I'm done with it. And then boom, something happens. Something as simple as someone offering, do you want to donate for the Breast Cancer Foundation when you go to farmers, right? Yeah. And you're like, ah, oh, do you even know what you're talking about? I mean, great. Yeah. I've had people who said, People, they've, they've started crying, you know, and then the lady at the counter, she's like, what did I do wrong? And when they've expressed and when they've shared their journey and said, well, I happen to be a survivor myself, all that they can do was they hugged each other. Mm. It literally left the person, the person behind the counter came and she hugged that and she's like, I'm so sorry. And she said, no, you don't, even I'm sorry. I never thought I'm going to react so strongly, but that's yeah. just how it is. Um, it's a, it's a, I could say it's a kind of a really beautiful journey. And I think it's been like the last year, people have learned a lot from the pandemic. Yeah. Um, I think for me, it's been like my most intensive course on life. <laughs> yeah. You know, but all the tools that I've been collecting over my 47 years have really, really put to test. And um, I can't say it, it made it any easier maybe, but um, it is what it is. Yeah. Yeah. It is. Um, right. 
I, that left it on a bit of a oh but <laughs> I want to move on to sleep now because we do keep bringing it up and it is a very important part of what you do so we will reconvene next week which will be five minutes or a minute or so in real life but for everybody listening it will be next week so thank you for sharing your story uh we could have gone on for so much longer about it and i have a million other questions but yes just thank you for, for that yeah. just it is well, i have a small scary. I do have a small freebie though, if anybody oh, yes. is interested, because I had uh, written about my journey um, in one of her books, which was I'm a co-author of. Um, it's basically four of us had got together and all of us are not, I was the only one who was talking about my cancer journey, yeah. but it's, it's 24, 23 other women who have really risen from, it's called the Shakti awakening. So you know what Shakti is. So it's, it's of the Shakti mats. Yeah, yeah, yes. <laughs> Well, those are a little bit more painful. <laughs> <laughs> but Shakti is basically the inner strength that each and every one of us um, have all the time. Yeah. And it's really about how we risen kind of the rising of the phoenix. That's the other way of looking at it. And so that's a new book. And I would be more than happy if anybody's interested, then, you know, they could, I don't know how you connect, but I would be happy if to just share the link and they can, if they yes. just want to think about it. Well, what I can do, if you um, give me the link, I can pop it in the show notes. Absolutely, absolutely. Along with all of your details of how to get in touch, yeah. your websites, your LinkedIn, Instagram, and Facebook. Yeah, gosh. Well, and <laughs> um, also I've got written down that you've got a couple of workshops coming up or master classes. Do you want to tell me about those before we sign off for this week? Yeah, that's right. So one master class is really um, because I have a part time job at um, Auckland Sleep where we really kind of, uh, we, we have an umbrella of people who have sleep related problems and we've got physicians under us, you know, mm -hmm. and what we do is we kind of do the initial assessment. So yeah. you've got about seven or eight questionnaires that we, that, you know, I would be asking. Mm -hmm. And then that is followed at the end of that, we get an, a clearer idea of whom you need to see because sleep is so big, right? It's such a big yeah. umbrella. And so it's really about directing and seeing where it could really help and who would really help, what could help. Um, giving you a little bit of a direction and we actually help you and we actually would refer them and we follow up with you and things like that. So the masterclass is that part of it, along with some tips that I would be giving along with it as well. So, you know, like sleep hygiene or whatever. So that's one part of it. Um, and that's one masterclass. This is for the general people. You don't have to have cancer for that. It's for anybody who's got any sleep related problems. Many a times we have people who come with their partners because that's the main thing. knows more than they do. <laughs> yeah, yeah. So that's one masterclass. And the other one is really about, it's called, what did cancer do to my sleep? Um, okay. And that's pretty much what I'm talking about, which is, you know, what exactly happens. A little bit of the science, because no one really wants to know so much of the science. What people really want to know is what can we do about it? But yeah. to know what to do about it, you need to have that little bit of that background. So it's going a little bit into that, the different parts of your cancer journey and what you can actually do to try and get back a little bit of a normal sleep to really make you feel like it's worth getting out of bed, no matter what. Um, and that's the, that's the other masterclass that I'm doing as well. Right. Yeah, yeah. and it's a whole good. integrative thing. It's a whole integrated thing. It's not only about taking the melatonin, not taking the sleeping tablets or anything. It's really about everything else that's also helped me on my journey as well, whether it's food and nutrition, whether it's aromatherapy, you know, the all the yeah. other things can be there because I really have I really believe strongly in an integrative uh, approach to cancer as well yeah well everything's connected yes yes absolutely like things out of out of sync yes it's like dominoes yeah yeah so those are my two master classes that are coming up yeah excellent um do you have booking links for those well, <laughs> I know I should be, but I haven't made it as yet. But yeah, I could just pick it and then I could, uh, you know, we could share it with you. Or if people really want, then, you know, share a website. Because for me, it's also about getting a maximum number of people. So I'm kind of open right now to see whether weekdays or weekends work. And, um, okay. you know, from there. because, um, yeah, the more, the better. But also I am limiting the number of people as well, because it has to be personalized too. So I'm just right now collecting what people are looking at and what would be the convenience for them and then take it from there. 
so people can get in touch with you via the website. I think that's the best thing. Yeah, I think that would be the best way to go about it. Perfect. All right. Well, thank you very much. Thank you, Amy. This is wonderful. <laughs> we'll chat about sleep in just a moment. Thank you. <laughs> thank you for listening to the Women's Wellness Podcast. For links and show notes, please visit www.connecthealth.fitness forward slash podcast. I would love for you to subscribe to the channel so you get notified when we release our next episode. And please share with anyone who you think might benefit. Thank you again. I look forward to seeing you soon.